Well, welcome to this lecture on misunderstandings and objections to the moral argument for God. I love this argument. <laughs> I really do love this argument. I, I learned it initially, I think, from reading C.S. Lewis, uh, Mere Christianity, and then um, more specifically uh, from uh, Dr. William Lane Craig. Uh, learned it uh, from his writings and uh, observing his debates. And, uh, and probably, I've done over 80 debates uh, now on campuses, and almost every one of them has involved this argument. It was either one of three arguments I was presenting for God's existence, or the debate was entirely about this argument. So uh, I love it. I've seen it be very effective in people's lives. And I think it contains some really significant points that are helpful for other parts of our epistemology, too, of understanding uh, uh, what we know and how we know. I, uh, when I was uh, really getting into this argument, I was doing grad work at the University of Toronto in philosophy, and I was in a, a course there called Meta Ethics, where you're basically discussing the foundations of ethics and morality. And I had a, a professor who uh, was an atheist, but while he was more than an atheist, he was a Marxist. In fact, to be more accurate, he's probably a Stalinist. I mean, he was, uh, he was an extreme person, but actually an extremely nice guy. <laughs> and I had uh, about 12 other students in this class, grad students. And we all had uh, took turns giving presentations from time to time. It was, it was my turn to give a presentation on the ethics of David Hume. And so I was just explaining what David Hume said about ethics. And I just kind of threw in this statement as an afterthought. It really wasn't a main theme of my presentation. I said, and, uh, and, and of course, if, if God does not exist, then no uh, objective moral values or duties exist. Well, by the time the rest of the class and the prof finished laughing at me, I realized what I thought was you know, a pretty obvious statement of most evangelical Christians, C.S. Lewis and Francis Schaeffer and W.L. Craig and myself thought was obviously true, they did not agree. And that really forced me to go much, much deeper uh, into, uh, into this issue. What I want to do is I want to take the first few minutes to uh, present the argument the way I would present it in a debate when it would be one of three arguments that I'm presenting. So I usually have 20 minutes to present these arguments, so this would kind of be uh, you know, one third of that time or maybe a little bit less. But this is the way I do it on a secular campus. I usually have a, have a slide. I decided not to go with slides today, but by the way. I've been, uh, PowerPoint and I have a love-hate relationship and today it's hate, so <laughs> I decided to, uh, to put it aside. Uh, so I usually have a slide saying, God is the best explanation for objective moral values and duties. Now by objective, I mean valid and binding, whether anyone believes in them or not, that is true, independent of people's opinions. Just like two plus two equals four, even if everyone in this room or everyone in the world disagreed, it would still be equal to four. Now deep down, I say we all know objective moral values and obligations do exist. Even people who claim to be moral relativists live as if morality is objective. You see, it's very easy to say there are no objective values, moral values and obligations, but it's much more difficult to live as if there are none. And, and the way we live, the judgments we make when ourselves and others are treated unjustly, uh, reveal what we really believe about morality regardless what we say we believe. So we believe that the Holocaust, or raping little girls, or torturing toddlers, toddlers for fun, are moral abominations. They're not just flouting some social convention, or uh, some personal dislikes, or even just actions that maybe don't maximize my self-interest. These are abominations, and we think everyone else should agree that they're abominations. Now, if somebody else walked into this room and said, hey, well, you know, you guys may think that torturing toddlers for sport is morally wrong, but, you know, me and my buddies, we think it's great sport. We wouldn't say, oh, my goodness, I guess it's not objectively wrong after all. I guess morality is just relative. No, we would deduce that there's something wrong with those guys. They're not functioning properly. And if they were functioning properly, they would recognize how morally reprehensible those actions were. So it's clear, at least, that some things are objectively wrong. But if there is no God, it's very difficult to see how there could be any objective foundation, any universal standard for good and evil. How do you get ethics from only different arrangements of space, time, matter, and energy? Because if there's no God, that's all you've got to work with. 
a purely materialistic universe would be morally indifferent. Humans, like everything else in the universe, would be just accidental arrangements of atoms. And therefore, we could not justifiably declare human beings are objectively valuable. And why I think the morality of the human species, above all other species, is objectively binding rather than just our opinion. Moral judgments then would be just relative and subjective, merely expressions of personal tastes. Or they might be social conventions, pragmatic suggestions for survival that societies agreed upon so that people can live together without chaos. But in neither case would they be objectively binding moral obligations. Maybe rape is not socially advantageous and over time has become forbidden, but this does nothing to prove that rape is really objectively <coughs> wrong. Now don't misunderstand me. This is not to say that atheists can't be moral. It's just that if there is in fact no God, there would be no basis for the objective morals that we all believe in, atheist and theist alike. The problem here is not the absence of belief in God, but the absence of God. The atheist philosopher Michael Roos drives this point home. He says, the position of the modern evolutionist is that humans have an awareness of morality because such an awareness is of biological worth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction. Any deeper meaning is illusory. He adds, we must conclude that Darwinian ethics positively excludes the objectivist approach. Now this is a serious problem for naturalism or atheism. And formally the argument goes like this. If God does not exist, objective moral values and obligations do not exist. Two, objective moral values and obligations do exist and we all know it. And therefore it follows logically that God exists. So this is the choice before us. If you are confident that atheism is true, it seems you must give up the reality of objective moral values and obligations and that therefore the Holocaust or raping little girls or torturing toddlers for sport are not really wrong. But if you are confident that the Holocaust or raping little girls or torturing toddlers for sport are objectively wrong, then logically you must give up atheism. Since we know that objective moral values and obligations do exist, since they cannot exist without God, it follows that God exists. God's holy and good nature provides a foundation for the moral values which the atheist just has to accept by faith. Now, um, there's a point in your outline there that asks the question, which form of the argument is, is best? And frankly, I'm not going to get into this in detail. Scholars are debating whether you should present this argument as an inference to the best explanation, which is the way I introduced it or present it as those three premises as a deductive argument, which is the way I ended it. Frankly, I think both are useful, and uh, uh, I tend to mix the two together, to be, to be quite honest, and uh, that's all I'm going to say on that. Let's move right into some of the misunderstandings and objections, some of the, some of the pushback that I found we tend to get from this. And the first one, it, it just always comes up, it's the first one. Are you saying atheists can't be moral? And this is said with, with strong emotion. Um, and, and I think we actually have to empathize with the atheists on this. They do feel like they perceive that this is what the theistic world is saying to them, that they can't be moral, that they aren't good people. So I think we need to empathize with that, but just point out very clearly that that's not what this argument is, is about. This argument is about foundations, the foundation uh, of objective morality. And the question is not must we believe in God in order to recognize objective values. The atheist should recognize that torturing toddlers for sport is wrong just as much as the theist should, should. And the question is not can we formulate some system of ethics without referring to God? Because an atheist could do that if they begin with the right assumptions. If they begin with the intrinsic value of human beings just as an assumption on their part, they could probably put together a system of ethics that we would agree with to a, l a large extent. No, the, it's not about the necessity of belief in God. It's the necessity of the existence of God uh, for these objective moral principles that we claim to know to be able to actually exist and for our beliefs to not be a delusion. So belief in God is not necessary for objective moral values. God is necessary. Well, the second pushback I get, and it's become more in the last few years, 
is, well, you can't prove that objective moral values exist. Uh, how do you know? And this is after I've, you know, I've given uh, arguments and evidence. Uh, last fall, I was speaking at University of British Columbia up in Vancouver and Simon Fraser University uh, the following day, also in Vancouver. And I was actually giving three arguments for God's existence and opening up for questions. In both, both campuses, all of the questions were about the moral argument, and almost all of them were about this issue. How can you claim that objective moral values exist? Where's your justification? How do you know? And um, as you saw in my presentation, I tend to try to draw to the surface people's moral intuitions by using examples of horrible atrocities, like torturing toddlers uh, for sport. Uh, let me throw another one out that uh, maybe is in, in the same level of atrocity, but it really works well for students. This apparently it was originally a true story. Who knows the legends that have uh, accrued to it, but there's a story about a, a, a young philosophy student that wrote a paper arguing that there are no objective moral um, values and duties, that everything's just a matter of one's subjective likes and dislikes. And the paper was actually quite well done. He had researched it well, uh, it was well documented, it was, uh, it was well written and logically ordered, and it really was the kind of paper that deserved an A, whether the professor agreed with it or not, it deserved an A. When the prof got the paper though, he took one look at it, took out his red felt pen and wrote, F. I do not like blue folders. <laughs> the student had put his paper in a blue folder. Well, when the student got his paper back, he came running into the prof's office and he was just incensed. He said, this is not fair, this is not just. I shouldn't be graded on the basis of the color of my cover, but the content of my paper. And the prof looked up, he was marking a lot of papers at that time. Is this the paper that argued there are no objective moral values and obligations? <laughs> like fairness and justice? <laughs> that it's all just a matter of one's subjective likes or dislikes? Student was a little slow to catch on. He said, yeah, that's the paper, that's the one. <laughs> Prof said, well, I do not like blue folders. The grade will remain an F. All of a sudden, the student realized that he really did believe in objective moral values like fairness and justice, and he was expecting them to be applied to him right then and there in that situation. So students tend to identify with that. <laughs> With, uh, with that one, and I usually joke around with the students that I teach that I'm going to grade them on the basis of the color of their cover and <laughs> see how they respond. But you see, we all know that those, those, those sort of things are wrong, and our, our intuitions get drawn to the surface by examples, and especially when the examples are uh, personal. And so if, if I find real pushback from students, I personalize more the example. And I apologize ahead of time for such a horrible example, but I will say to a, a student, or if it's a, an older person who might be married, I'll say, so uh, what if it was your four-year-old sister or your four-year-old daughter who was abducted, raped, mutilated, and murdered? Would you say that the person who did that, have they done something wrong or not? It's almost impossible for an honest person, it is impossible for an honest person to say, no, they haven't really done something morally wrong. Because God has written the law on their hearts. Romans 2, 14 and 15 says that even the pagans had the law written on their hearts. And so when we use examples like that, it draws to the surface what God has put in there. Now, God has originally put it in there, and, um, but it can be changed and it can be altered over time and, and we can move far away from those moral principles and it doesn't mean we follow them. But there's still remnants of them there for most people. These examples draw them to the surface. And so um, what I ended up doing uh, with these students from UBC and, and, uh, and, and Simon Fraser, um, actually, I'm going to hold off and tell you what I, what I did just a little bit later. But let me, uh, let me um, re respond this way in, to their, their question. What I really want to say to people who, who bring this object objection up is that you and I are directly aware of the truth of many moral values. And we are directly aware of it through our moral intuition. Now by intuition, I don't mean a feeling. By intuition, I don't mean, sometimes they say woman's intuition, that sort of thing. No, it, it's a philosophical term. Uh, when someone has reflected carefully and considered carefully 
uh, some, some point, some belief. And uh, they strongly sensed uh, the, the, the truth of something or the falsity of something. That's what I mean by, by intuition. And so their objection was, this is just a feeling that you're basing all this on. Well, there's a difference between knowing something to be true and showing something to be true. You can know something to be true even if you're unable to show it to somebody else. Maybe you'll be able to show it at a later time, but you could know it now and not be able to sh show it at this moment. And so maybe their objection is true. Maybe there's a kernel of truth in the sense that maybe we can't show or prove to someone else that the objective moral obligations exist. Because in a sense, my examples don't prove it. They just bring their moral sense, their intuitions to the surface so that they know it. I haven't shown it, but I th believe I've helped them know it if they are honest. So the moral, uh, and this isn't any different really than the natural world of the physical objects. Um, you can't prove that physical objects exist either. You can't really prove that. You could actually be, we all could actually be in a matrix experiencing a virtual reality. That is possible. And that's what skeptics say. And they say we, they don't, they say we can't know anything because that's a possibility. Well, that doesn't follow logically. So the moral order of values is actually on a similar order, uh, for similar footing as the natural order of physical objects. Just as we assume the reality of the world of physical objects on the basis of our sense experience, so too we assume the reality of the moral order on the basis of our moral experience. In both cases, here's the key point, we have a direct awareness of reality. And this idea that, that um, uh, intuition is just a feeling is confused. Think about your sense of sight. You see a tree in front of you. Well, what are you experiencing exactly? Well, you are having a direct awareness of reality. It would be easy to call this experience a feeling, but that would be to confuse it with an emotion, which it is not. It's an experience, yes, of direct awareness of the tree. Consider another category. When you read or hear an argument in the form logicians call modus ponens, something like, if P, then Q. P, therefore, Q. Q. All those of you who answered know modus ponens, even though you may not have heard that term before. It's a logical name for a logical inference. There's no proof for modus ponens. There might, there might be a couple of you that didn't quite get that. Let me give an example. If Socrates is a man, Socrates is mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. See, you either get that or you don't. You directly experience the truth of the logical inference from if P then Q, P therefore Q. It would be easy to call this experience a feeling but that would confuse it with an emotion, which it's not. It's a direct awareness of a logical truth through our rational sense. So we had our physical sense of sight, a rational sense. Well, likewise, when you're asked to think about various examples of moral behavior and asked if they are morally wrong or morally good, you directly experience the truth of many of such examples. I'm not saying every time you do, clearly, but there are many that you do, and that's all you need for the argument to work. Like torturing toddlers for sport. Morally wrong. Now, it would be easy to call this experience a feeling, but that would confuse it with an emotion, which it is not. It is a direct awareness of a moral truth through our moral sense. All moral reasoning actually begins with intuitions like this. You uh, you read or listen to moral arguments that people have, either at the popular level or at the philosophical level, when they're disagreeing with, e with each other, they are, all, they are going back to different moral intuitions that they think are, are correct. All moral reasoning begins with those intuitions. Even atheist philosophers like Louise Anthony do not have strong doubts about our ability to know objective moral truth. Any argument for moral skepticism, she says, will be based upon premises which are less obvious than the existence of objective moral values themselves. See, she's implying how obvious it is that there are objective moral truths, 
and the examples that I said, I think, brings those to our surface. She recognizes the strength of our knowledge of moral values through direct awareness. We are warranted in claiming to know some moral truths. Now, this does not mean that we can never be wrong about our moral beliefs. But this is also the case with our direct awareness of the physical world. We are mistaken at times uh, about what we think we're seeing. Uh, we s I saw a bent stick in the water. No, it wasn't really a bent stick. But in both categories, our beliefs obtained through direct awareness are prima facie justified. Prima facie, Latin for first face, means at first glance. Um, they are innocent until proven guilty. They are justified in the absence of any defeaters of those beliefs. Our sensory beliefs are justified unless there's a defeater of them. They are soon to be justified and likewise so are moral beliefs. So what I'm saying is this, if one carefully reflects on something and a certain viewpoint intuitively seems to be true, then one is justified in believing that viewpoint in the absence of some overriding counterarguments. Now this is not infallible. Our beliefs can be altered and conditioned by our culture. But it seems that the empiricist assumptions of our Western culture make it difficult for most of us to warm up to this idea of direct awareness. And that's the way it has been for me for the last 25 years. I, I knew that these moral um, truths were really true, but only as I put this all together with my understanding of epistemology as a whole do I realize it's really the same um, as uh, our uh, awareness through our, our senses and, uh, and our rational awarenesses. They're all direct awareness of, of different things that we know unless there's a, a, an overwhelming uh, counterargument. Now it also means that an appeal to intuition does not mean that you might be able to add some additional arguments that could support those intuitions later. Therefore, the best hope for a rational, unified view of reality is to postulate God as the ground of both the natural and the moral orders. Now, back to the UBC and Simon Fraser uh, student situation. What I finally realized was uh, to, what I should do was just extend that um, little story about people walking into the room saying, me and my friends don't think torturing toddlers for sport is wrong. We think it's, it's just a lot of fun. And to say, what would we call people? What do we call people who would say that? In our culture, what do we call people who think torturing toddlers for sport is just great, great fun? What would we call them? Psychopath or sociopath, right? And so what I t told these students is, my argument is not that you are psychopaths. I don't think you are. And that means deep down you really do believe that these things are wrong. Those are your only two options. <laughs> Which one do you think is likely the case? That you're a psychopath? <laughs> or that you really do believe the torturing toddlers for sport is morally wrong. I found that did finally get somewhere with, with some people. Third objection or misunderstanding, humanism. Secular humanism basically says whatever promotes human flourishing and survival is good. Whatever weakens it is bad. That's all you need for morality. You don't need God. But here the issue is, is, is quite simple. The naturalistic humanist has no access to the critical assumption that they are assuming, but it's not explicitly stated there, which is, you can add this to your notes there, which is that human beings are objectively valuable. The naturalist doesn't have access to that assumption. Because as we saw, human beings, if there is no God, are just accidental arrangements of atoms. Sometimes this argument is pushed a bit, and they say, well, look, if you want to promote human flourishing, then we ought to live cooperatively or we ought to follow the golden rule. This comes up always in the debates against atheist professors. I think they think it's, a, it's really going to turn the tables on me because now they're using the Jesus' golden rule as the foundation of morality. Uh, but this is a little misconceived. Not only is this confusing knowing objective moral values with finding the foundation for those moral values, there is no more, more moral obligation to these rules, even the golden rule, than, as Dr. William Craig says, if you want this slime mold to flourish, then you should keep the temperature and humidity moderate. <clears throat> There's no moral obligation for you to do that. Well, humans are merely more complex slime that have evolved certain complex features by a completely accidental, impersonal chance 
process unless God was behind it. Therefore, they are no more objectively valuable than the slime. Why? Well, and if you say they are, that's just speciesism because it's just the humans saying we're more valuable than other species. That's the ultimate in racism or sexism. It's just like saying, you know, white people are more valuable than black people. That's just a white person saying that. There's no reason to think that is true. And saying there's no reason, if there is no God, to think that human beings are more valuable than any other arrangement of atoms in the universe. Another pushback on this argument is, look, there are different understandings philosophically of what the word objective means. And we mean something a little different by it. That's true. They do mean something a little different by it. What they're thinking is that we can reason objectively to the right thing to do given certain bas basic beliefs like it's wrong to harm human beings. I grant, if that's what you mean by objective, given that assumption, you can objectively reason to the right thing to do. But they don't understand that they don't have access to that assumption if there's no God and human beings are just accidental arrangements of atoms and that the notion of objective in this, this argument uh, contains the idea of a foundation, <coughs> that there needs to be a objective foundation for the morality. I'm going to skip number four because uh, as I was going through this, I realized that the response is really the same one I just gave to humanism. This is just kind of a different uh, uh, path of, uh, of humanism. So let's move to number five. Naturalistic evolution can explain our moral values, obligations, and moral sense. This is pretty popular these days. First, now all, the, all five of these points are in your notes. Naturalism holds that only things that can be described by science really exist. Since you can't find moral values in a test tube, they do not really exist. They're merely human illusions. Secondly, if the naturalist is willing to go beyond the boundaries of science, the best that moral values can be, if there is no God, are just the byproduct of biological evolution and social condition that provide survival value for the species. And if there is no God, and if morality evolved because it provides survival benefits, I'm expanding on number two here, we would not have a justification for objective morality but merely an explanation for how moral beliefs arose. In fact, it would be difficult to see how these beliefs or behaviors could even be considered morality anymore. They would be mere suggestions for survival. That's a far cry from objective moral principles. Does self-preservation really capture what we mean when we say something is moral? Does mere prudence really capture what we mean by morality? On this evolutionary model, we would feel that objective moral principles exist, but they really wouldn't. Are you really willing to accept the idea that while rape, murder, and discrimination feel wrong, they really aren't? And once we figured out that our feeling of morality with regard to, say, rape, is just a biological adaptation inculcated into us over millions of years, then we would have no reason to regard rape as objectively wrong anymore even though we, we feel that it is. Once we've figured out that our moral sense is just a byproduct of evolution and social conditioning, why well, think it imposes any obligations on us anymore? Third, on the naturalist view, humans are just animals, and animals have no moral obligations. As uh, Bill Craig has, has pointed out, actually, shouldn't turn the page till I finish reading it. As he's pointed out, lions don't murder zebras. Male great white sharks don't rape the female when they forcibly copulate with them. There's no moral dimension to these actions in the animal kingdom. So if God does not exist, why think that we have moral obligations to do anything? Who or what imposes these moral duties on us? Where do they come from? Certain actions like rape may not be biologically and socially advantageous, so over time have become taboo, but that does nothing to show that rape is really wrong. Fourth, if, if uh, and only if God does not exist, is a socio-biological account of our moral sense true, and thus our moral beliefs illusory. But that's no reason to think that the socio-biological account actually is true, and thus no reason to deny what our moral experience tells us. Craig writes, if God does not exist, then moral values are mere byproducts of biological and social evolution. But if God exists, then they're not. Even if 
Evolution was the way God did it. For the truth of a belief is independent of how you came to hold that belief. You may have acquired your moral beliefs through a fortune cookie or by reading tea leaves, and they could still be true. In particular, if God exists, then objective moral values and duties exist, regardless of how we come to learn about them. Uh, I believe in democracy. And someone says, well, yeah, that's just because you were brought up in the West. Well, that doesn't mean that democracy isn't the best system. It could still be true that it is the best system. The sociobiological account at best proves that our perception of moral values and duties has evolved. But if moral values are gradually discovered, not invented, then our gradual and fallible perception of those values no more undermines their objective reality than our gradual, fallible perception of the physical world undermines its objective reality. Fifth response to naturalistic evolution. Naturalistic evolution is self-defeating since if it is true, then we should be skeptical of all our beliefs. That is, we, we shouldn't really believe anything, including naturalistic evolution. After all, all of our beliefs are the result of evolution and social conditioning. Sixth, moral Platonism, or you could add the word atheistic moral Platonism to your notes there. They say, can provide a foundation for objective moral values without God. Well, let me quickly respond here. Moral values, first of all, make more sense as properties of persons it's quite difficult to make any sense of what it means for, say, the abstract object justice to just exist. What does that mean? Well, some philosophers do think that abstract objects do just, just exist. Uh, others have trouble. That, that, that doesn't really make any sense. See, the good as an abstract object would not be good because abstract objects can't be good or act good or act lovingly or kindly because they are not personal. Moreover, persons are valuable because God is a person. So it makes, makes more sense that these values would exist as properties of a person, like say maybe the mind of God. Secondly, there's no basis for moral duties on Platonism, even if moral values like justice, loyalty, and mercy could just exist in some sense why would you have a duty to be merciful? Who or what puts that obligation on you? Philosophers agree that abstract, abstract objects, if they exist, uh, cannot cause anything. They have no causal efficacy. Furthermore, since moral vices, as well, on the Platonic view, also just exist, why wouldn't we also be obligated to hate? There's just no grounds for moral obligation on the Platonic view. And thirdly, there's, it's an utterly incredible coincidence that blind evolutionary processes should spit forth precisely the sort of creatures, us, who correspond to the abstractly existing realm of moral values. Much more plausible that the laws of nature and the moral law are both under the authority of God than to think these two independent realms just happen to mesh. They just happen to relate to each other. Seven, and this is probably the main one, uh, the more sophisticated the person is who you're talking to. The Euthyphro dilemma shows that God cannot be the foundation of morality, they say. Moral values, they say, are either independent of God, if he wills them because they are good, or they are just arbitrary, if they are good just because God wills them. But there actually is a third option. God wills them because he is good. So it's not a dilemma. There's a third option. God's own nature is the standard of goodness, and his commandments to us are expressions of his essentially good nature. The morally good and bad is determined by God's nature. The morally right and wrong determined by his will. God wills something because he is good, and something is right because God wills it. When the atheist demands, well, if God were to command child, uh, child abuse, would we be obligated then to abuse our children? It's like asking the question, if there were a square circle, would its area be the square of one of its sides? It's logically incoherent. There's no answer because what it supposes is logically in impossible. And it's logically impossible for God to command things contrary to his good nature. But they say, but why think God's nature is the ultimate stopping point rather than some other thing? 
Because God is the greatest conceivable being by definition. That's what we mean by the concept of God. And it's greater to be the paradigm of goodness than it is just to conform to it. So God must be the paradigm of goodness. And God is thus a being worthy of worship and adoration. There's nothing higher than God. Any finite stopping point that an atheist could offer seems arbitrary and implausible compared to God, the greatest conceivable being, by definition. So God, as the greatest conceivable being, is the only plausible ultimate stopping point. But, the atheist says, if God is good, then to claim God is good is to say nothing more than God is, is God, which is trivial. Well, it makes no sense to ask of one's ultimate stopping point, is it good because it creates or recognizes the good? Neither one. It just is the good. The standard, the definition of good and evil. God is good because his nature is good. The paradigm of goodness. The measuring stick by which all else is compared. His nature defines the good. And here's the key thing that you, you should do in this situation. Ask the atheist what his ultimate stopping point is for the good. If you ask him, is it good because it creates the good or because it recognizes the good? He would not accept either. He would say, well, it just is the good, the standard, the ultimate, and legitimate stopping point. Well, that is what the theist is saying about God's nature. And that, God's nature, is more plausible than any naturalistic stopping point. Let's skip down to another point here, number three. But isn't the whole process circular? You seem to be saying that in order to know God is good, one must know what good is. But in order to know what good is, God must exist. Well, this objection is confusing the order or category of knowing, which is epistemology, with the order or category of being, which is called ontology. In the order of knowing, the concept of goodness precedes the concept of God. We know the concept of goodness uh, before we try to say, is God good or not? In the order of being, though, the existence of God logically precedes the existence of goodness. Only if one confuses these two categories do you get circular reasoning. The point is we recognize that God's being and actions are consistent with the concept of good that we have through our intuitions. And, and these, this is ultimately rooted in our intuitions. Just like our understanding of basic logical axioms and inferences though, our conscious awareness of these basic moral truths only come about as we develop intellectually and socially. We then can call good without arguing in a circle. Number eight, doesn't appealing to God though undercut appealing to the reasons why something is morally good or right or bad or wrong? A and it seems that real objective morals requires doing things for good reasons not just because someone commands it, even God. That is, obeying God because he has good reasons for what he commands. So just appealing to God, though, seems to undercut these reasons. Well, certainly there, can be, there still can be reasons for what God commands. For example, he forbids raping little children because it would be unjust and injurious to them. But then the deeper question is, why is it wrong to cause injury to innocent persons? What determines what is just or unjust? Eventually such questions must find a stopping point in the character of God. Kindness is good because that's the way God is. Cruelty is evil because it's inconsistent with God's nature. Therefore he issues commands that forbid behavior which is cruel and prescribe behavior which is kind. Now I'm skipping number nine because there were actually four different seminars that were really on this topic one way or the other. Most of you have probably taken one of them and it really requires a, 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 long, a full lecture for the answer. There's a short paragraph they there to give you a little bit of response. But let me move to just two very quick short ones that I've added, number 10 and 11, uh, that are not in your notes. Number 10, is the fact of our moral judgments itself a grounding of them? That's what my Marxist-Stalinist professor would say to me. We would both agree that we know objective morality exists. We agreed on that. And he said, well, that, that means that it is objective. I, I said, yes, it means that 
the, that there is objective moral truth there, but it doesn't provide the foundation for it. See, just because we know moral obligations exist, it does not logically follow that we actually have a justification or foundation for them. The fact of our moral judgments it's, does not itself ground them. That everyone shares the belief only means no one's going to ask us to justify it, not that it is justified. If we genuinely know that some actions, such as infanticide, are wrong, then that knowledge must have an ultimate source, cause, foundation. Finally, number 11. The Christian view, they say, teaches that you should do the right thing only because of the reward. Right? The only reason you should obey God is so you, you could go to heaven. Well, it may be that many religious people do think this way. But this actually isn't the case. This isn't what Christianity teaches. The morally valuable in Christian thinking is to be desired for its own sake. And God's nature is the paradigm of moral virtue. So the Christian view, I say, may actually correctly combine the motivations of reward and desiring the good for its own sake. After all, the reward on Christianity is a personal relationship with God forever. And since God's nature is the paradigm of good, then the reward, God himself, is desired for his own sake. The Christian view makes sense of those two things together. And isn't the book of Job all about that? Isn't that what Satan came and accused uh, Job of just loving God because of all the good things you've done him and, and, and you, did, you did for him and uh, God was uh, wanted to point out that that's not the case with my servant Job and uh, clearly shows that uh, God did not accept uh, Satan's theology. So in conclusion I um, just want to tell you a brief story about uh, our oldest son Sean. Uh, Sean did a degree in philosophy at Simon Fraser University in, uh, in Vancouver um, and uh, he was taking an upper level course in meta-ethics. And what was interesting about the course is that there was absolutely no discussion of God at all. It wasn't one of the options that was being considered and discussed and then, and then dismissed after discussion. No, it was dismissed a priori. It was never even discussed. It just assumed that any sort of theory that God was connected with morality um, uh, has been refuted. And what they decided though, or what the course is all about, was trying to provide a naturalistic foundation for objective morality. And went, they went through all the different attempts that are being, that have been tried and are being tried by scholars right now. And the consensus at the end of the course that the professor shared was that there is no consensus among naturalistic philosophers that we have found an adequate foundation for morality. Exactly, my son got a great education there. He saw how weak the naturalistic arguments really were. So I want to encourage you, this is a great argument. It uh, touches people where they are, um, where, they, where they feel, where they live, where they think, what they believe. You know, learn it, uh, treasure it, uh, learn how to respond to objections, but most of all, make use of it when God provides opportunities. Thank you very much. Now, uh, we're about six minutes over time, but we were also six minutes late starting. So if you want to uh, ask some questions, uh, I'll stay here for the next few minutes. Uh, and then we want to get to the 12 o'clock session. So we have about five minutes for some questions for those that want to do it. I'll try to repeat your question and then uh, see if I can give an answer. Who has the first question? Right there? Go ahead. Um, so just a question about the humanism argument. Yes. Yes, very good. You, you could actually expand the, uh, the criteria for what uh, fits in the category of being objectively valuable as being all sentient creatures. And then the same response would, would be wh wh what makes them objectively valuable. Um, they're still accidental arrangements of atoms and so are cockroaches and so are rocks and everything else. And we're just saying that well more complex beings are more valuable. But why would that be true if there is no God? But 
Again, that's, that's us putting the, uh, the value on conscious beings. That would be just like a white person saying, well, white people, you know, sh are valuable because, well, well, they're white. Isn't that obvious? And so there's really no objective re response to that because all arrangements of atoms are, on in terms of value, the same in the universe. Subjectively, we may value them more, but objectively, they're all just an accidental arrangement of atoms. Okay, good question though. Yes? Would you say that it's completely impossible to develop a consistent um, naturalistic um, social contract theory of ethics? Well, it uh, depends what you mean by that question. Can, uh, can uh, and you develop an atheistic social contract view of ethics? You can if you begin with the proper assumptions like the intrinsic value and worth of all human beings. And I think I could and have worked with atheists on committees and in groups that do that. That's what the, uh, the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights was all about. Charles Malik, a Lebanese Christian, worked with Eleanor Roosevelt and a Canadian fellow, Jim, and I'm just, his name slips my mind right now. Um, and they worked together uh, on that assumption. They never did provide a foundation for that assumption. They began with that assumption. So the problem is not that they can't formulate a system with beginning with those assumptions. The problem is they just don't have a foundation for that assumption. But practically, we can work together with people if we agree to begin with some of those assumptions. Great question. Yes? Um, sometimes when I argue with my friend about the moral argument, he brings up um, objectivity doesn't exist because um, or absolute morals don't exist. He says, say, I say murder is absolutely wrong, but he says, um, what if someone's about to murder my parents and then I murder him, is that? Yeah, great. W what you brought up there is moral dilemmas. And this um, was one of the points I was gonna put in, but it just was getting too long. This is one of the main reasons many people are relativists and not absolutists. You notice I tended to use the word objective morals rather than absolute, because absolute is kind of a red flag word in our culture, because they do not think that, ab um, that um, absolutes can handle moral dilemmas. Now, what I'm gonna say is controversial within the Christian view, uh, cr cr Christian world. There are, there are philosophers, there are Christians that don't agree with me, but there are many, and I, I would say at this point, probably more, more that do. There is more than one way to understand absolutes. There's sort of the unqualified absolutism that you just never violate an absolute, that's what the Bible means, and so on. Well, notice the word absolute is not in the Bible, okay? Um, the, the concept is there, but we've kind of overreacted to our culture and made it much more than it is. There's another way of understanding absolutes called graded absolutism, and it goes like this. Often you're gonna find more than one absolute applies to a situation or impinges on a situation. Uh, classic example, Nazi comes to your door, asks you, are you hiding any Jews here? Well, truth telling is an absolute that applies to this situation. <coughs> but there's another absolute that applies. Protecting innocent people from torture and murder. Graded absolutism says what God requires of us in that situation is to choose the greater good. I, for one, have no trouble knowing what the greater good is to do that. I would lie to the Nazi to protect the, the lives of innocent people from torture and, and murder. Now, if you say, oh, but, oh but, you're, but you're lying, you can't lie. Well, if you say you need to you tell the truth, then you just think there's a different hierarchy. You think telling the truth is above protecting the lives of innocent people. Because whether you like it or not, more than one absolute is impinging on that situation, and you've just chosen a different hierarchy, and I think you're mistaken. I think the greater good is to save people's lives. So if you wanna find out more about that, um, uh, Bill Craig and J.P. Moreland's book, Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview, uh, they cover that in, in two different chapters on ethics in that big 700 page book, and uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very helpful. Uh, we do need to end now so we can go in to hear Greg Kukul. Thank you very much. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.